being a part of uh, this uh, project and this initiative to help people. Um, I, I always, it's amazing to me every time because I, I love what you said to that guy. No, we're one of the small churches in Vegas. But what's amazing to me is we have, we have some churches that work with us uh, around the country that are, that are large, that are, uh, would be considered mega churches. And, and quite honestly, in so many ways, you guys bring so much more to the table than some of those other churches. And that's a huge uh, testament to who you are as people and the culture and of your church. And uh, I'm amazed every time. So thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And that story was incredible. Um, that's why we do it. That's exactly what it is. It's people being able to find hope in something as simple as that and knowing that God cares about something as simple as the detail of them being able to buy groceries and pay for their laundry. And um, it's a prime example of uh, God saying, I know the, the number of hairs on your head. How much more will I take care of you? That's a prime example of that. So thank you. Um, so you guys were one of three that we did here in Las Vegas yesterday. And we ha also had two more going on in uh, Tampa yesterday as well. So there were five laundry projects happening yesterday that you were a part of, which is incredible. Uh, three, four different churches across the country that were helping out with that. Uh, just in Las Vegas yesterday, we were able to help uh, 82 families, um, family units. What's that? Is it 86? Did I get it wrong? Sorry, Corey. 86. Eight, thank you. I don't want to, I don't want to cheat. I don't want to cheat the numbers. 86, right? <laughs> Uh, I was trying to go reverse church numbers, you know, or it's 86. We did a hundred there. There's probably a hundred in there. Um, no, 86 families and uh, a little over a thousand loads of laundry that we washed for people yesterday. So yeah, huge, which is incredible. And, um, so before I get started, one of the things that I want, one of the people that I want to introduce you to, uh, is a guy, a good friend of mine that was here yesterday. Some of you got to meet him, um, that's been really involved with our laundry projects lately and, uh, helping bring some new things to the table. Uh, some new ideas of things that we're doing. And I want you to meet him because um, I know he doesn't look like it, but he is a professional football player. He's a little small for his, <laughs> for his profession, but he's okay. Um, he's good at, no, um, there, I, I, I always like to, I, I always like to, to show stories or hear people, uh, let people hear stories of people that are in environments that, um, maybe don't aren't conducive to serving the rest of the world but people that are living in that role and bringing their talents and their love to those type of environments and so um i want you to just for a couple minutes here uh from my good friend garrett who's right here he's plays for the tampa bay buccaneers and uh i, f I feel like he's i feel like Take me around, Thunder. Good morning. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so good. good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the, the great introduction. Um, again, I want to say thanks to Pastor Andre for the opportunity to come here and interact with you guys. Yesterday, like Jason said, was an unbelievable experience. Um, there's some familiar, familiar faces in here that, that uh, I was able to interact with and meet yesterday, and so it's great seeing all of you guys here today. Um, as much as I'm, I don't know how many football fans we have in here, but as exciting as that may or may not be, you guys are in luck because we're not going to talk about football for the next couple minutes. Um, <laughs> so just to give you a, a little backdrop of me and my story, um, I come from a very, just a very ordinary background. I, I grew up in a small farming community in Illinois, um, grew up on corn and, uh, and beef. And, and uh, I, I went to a small private Christian high school. Uh, my junior year, I remember going up to my, my high school coach and asking him if he thought that I had the potential to play Division I football. And he looked me right in the eye and he said no. And so I, uh, he shipped me up out to the very, very small town of Shadron, Nebraska. I played for a small Division II school out there in Nebraska. As soon as I got out there, I put on about 100 pounds and uh, found a little bit of success, a little bit more success, and a little bit more success. And I ended up getting drafted by the Cleveland Browns. Um, I was drafted by the Browns in 2013. Um, and, and so just to give you a little bit more background of, of my existence, I grew up in like what you would culturally say as a Christian family. That meant nothing, as it sadly means nothing in a lot of people's lives, but for me especially. Um, I got to college, and, and uh, 
I was involved with, with a, a solid group of Christians. I lived in my pastor's basement. Um, I, was a, I lived in, in a pretty much a, a little Christian bubble. Um, it wasn't until my second year of college that I really began to make my faith my own and allow my faith to become horizontal. Um, and so I, I, I continued throughout college. I ended up finding some success. I, I was very conservative in, in college. Never really went out, never drank, didn't really hang out with anybody. I was just very, very purpose-driven, very, very focused. I, again, I ended up getting, I was drafted by the Browns, and, and all of a sudden my world just kind of flipped. My world just kind of changed. And, and it's something that, I, that my mother and I constantly talk about is just how no one can really fathom and understand what it's like to be in the culture of the NFL. I went from a very, very small Christian high school where I wasn't, glamorized or looked at as anything that was going to be successful to a college in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, where we had 200 people come to our football games. We didn't have big gatherings or big groups of people coming to our games. And so I, I just, I, I came from this very, very modest background. Here I am now in the NFL. In, in Cleveland, I had this, I had this giant fan base. I, I went very, very quickly from a very small to minimal social media following to here I am now. And I have this, I mean, thousands and thousands of people following me on social media. I go anywhere in, in the town of Cleveland, in the surrounding suburbs, and I'm recognized and known by everybody. Um, I don't know how, how or what changed, but, but I, I, I didn't in college. Um, I, had, I had trouble meeting and being able to go on dates with girls. And here I am in the NFL, and it's like overnight, magically, I'm much more attractive. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and so... I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what it was about me physically that changed to, to, draw, to draw girls to, but something did. And so, so not only, so I have these different aspects of my life that changed when I got to the NFL. And from, from just social media to girls trying to talk to me, I have money in my pocket, I have all these things that have just changed. Um, I, had a very, I had a successful rookie year played in, in several games. My second year, I was fighting. I was, I was rotating for, the starting, for my starting spot. I play offensive line. I'm just one of those big fat guys that pushes people around. And so I was rotating. I was fighting all offseason for the starting spot. And come training camp, I was rotating, still fighting for the starting spot. I thought I was going to be the starting right guard. It's the guy next to the dude that snaps the ball to the quarterback, just one of those big fat guys up front. And here I am, and the end of training camp, and I get... I get a phone call the last the day of, of the last cuts, and I was cut by the Browns, and it was just a complete, just complete shock to me. Um, I was released from the Browns. Uh, about three hours later, my mom sent me a text from Matthew where Jesus says, "What is it to gain the entire world but forfeit your soul?" And and is is conservative. And as modest as my background was, growing up in a Christian family, growing, you know, I was the youth pastor of my church in Nebraska. I lived in the basement of my pastor's house. Um, I lived a very modest background. And here I am, and this verse couldn't have held more truth and more substance in my life. And, and it just opened my eyes, God opened my eyes to the reality that I had allowed social media, I had allowed girls, I had allowed money, I had allowed fame, you know, the accolations to define me and to, and to represent my purpose. And here I am with all of those stripped away. Um, it's really, really easy to put your worth in what you do. And for me, that, that just was so gradual and it was such a slippery slope because I put my worth in my social media following. I put my worth in my accolations. I put my worth in the girl I was dating. I put my worth in my money. I put my worth in my successes on the field. And, and, and all of a sudden, everything was taken away. And here I am now. And thankfully, my coach, my coach who drafted me left the Browns the, my, after my rookie year, went down to Tampa Bay. He ended up bringing me right down to Tampa Bay. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to be picked up right away. My contract was picking up, picked up by the Buccaneers. I went down right away, played three days after I got there. So I'm playing in Tampa. Had a horrible, horrible first, had a horrible year last year. I ended up rolling the ball back to the quarterback when I started. And it was just a really, it was just a bad year. And so I went from, I went from being the man in Cleveland to here I am in Tampa and I had to delete all my social media and turn it all off because I'm, I'm being told all sorts of crazy things that no mother would ever want their son to be told. And so, but my life was just flipped upside down. And so this verse from Matthew where Jesus talks about, you know, what is the gain the entire world before for your soul is just like saturating in my life. And, 
and because I went from having all the accolations, I went from having the different girls giving me attention, I went from having the success on the field to here I am in Tampa, it is hot, it is humid, my fat is just melting off my body, I mean, I'm miserable, I have no family there, I mean, I'm just getting, I'm getting yelled at and sweared at by everybody in the stadium, on social media, my coaches, it was just a horrible, horrible year. And, and so God used that, that moment, God used that time to completely mold me and reshape me and, re, and re, just refocus my framework. Um, and so I think about Paul in Philippians, and really this has just kind of been the essence of this last year for me. He says, um, but whatever's to my profit, I now consider loss. In Philippians 4, or in Philippians 3, 7 through 8. And he says, whatever is to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more is I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. And so, so really, the reality is, is that's been my verse the last four years. But it's only rung true, and it's only really come to light in, in this mysterious, elaborate way this last year when, when everything was taken away from me. And again, I grew up, I, you know, I lived in this little bubble. I was the youth pastor at my church in Nebraska. I, I lived in my pastor's basement, you know, like I grew up in a, in a Christian community and I went to a Christian school and here I am now. And it's like this verse reigns more true for me now after all of this existence in church and in community than it is ever before. And so the reality is like, that's what God's really shown me this last year is that nothing in the world that we ever accomplish or that we ever gain nothing I ever achieve, none of the accolations I ever obtain, nothing I ever do, none of the people I ever meet, none of the things I ever do ever define my worth, but more so compare to knowing intimately Jesus. Nothing compares. And so in that, through this, this year, this last year, really being able to just refocus and rethink and reprioritize things, you know, a desire in my heart the last couple of years has been this idea of putting together this project where we took the resource of washing clothes to people. Um, so in, in my traveling, in playing different, different in, in playing in different stadiums and different teams in different cities and different states, one of the things that, that's just been mind-boggling to me is this, is, are these pockets of obscure homeless people. And so as an NFL player, the, the resources that we have are just unbelievable. I will go into, my, I'll go into the locker room after practice, and I'll take off my sweaty, dirty clothes, everything, and I'll throw it in, a, in this giant bin, and it all has my number on it. And there's a staff of people that we have in the NFL on our team that will go to those bins, pick up my dirty clothes, take it to the washer and dryer, wash my clothes, then bring it back and hang it up for me. Now, that sounds great. I'm sure most of us would probably like that. But the reality is, is who am I that I deserve to have somebody else pick up my filth and wash it for me? Who am I that I get to stay in a five-star hotel, eat the best of food before games, and in, my, in the transit to stadiums and to, into the transit to our games... I'm looking in these viaducts and these, under, these passes, and I see these obscure pockets of homeless people, and I'm thinking to myself, like, why do I deserve to have these resources, these relationships, these people in my life to wash my clothes, do these things for me, when, when there's people here hurting, when there's people here who really desperately need it? And so God just instilled this desire in me, and he just kind of opened my eyes to, some, to, to a potential project and through through something that happened in Australia there were two guys that took a small van and they converted they put a washer and dryer in it and they plumbed it they outfitted it and they turned it into a, essentially a portable laundry station and so it was in my heart I was like Gary you, you have the resources to just go somewhere and do that and so I thought to myself okay Gary when you get back down to Tampa after OTAs when you have practice you're just going to go wash clothes for people and so I thought to myself okay like conceptually I can go, I could buy a van, I could buy a washer and dryer, put it in there, plumb it, outfit it, and I'll just go wash clothes for people. And so I had a conversation with my agent in early January. I was like, yeah, man, like, this is what I'm going to do. And we were just talking about what I was going to do this offseason. I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And he's like, whoa, we need to talk about this. <laughs> and, and what turned into what started as something that was just, a, just like a, a spark 
just idea in my heart manifested and grew into something that has been extremely, extremely beautiful. And through that, I was able to build a relationship with Jason, who's going to come back here in a few minutes and share. And, and it's turned into something where, where now we have, we, have, we have very large partnerships with Tide and Dexter and some of these very big corporate sponsors that are going to, going to, going to work alongside us and walk alongside us through engineering and developing this project. And so um, we have this very, very cool concept drawn up already. And essentially what we're going to do is we're turning a, a, a big work truck, so a big delivery truck, like a Lay's delivery truck or a big delivery truck, and we're converting it through um, some engineering into a portable laundry mat. And so there's going to be four washers and dryers on each side, and it's going to be completely engineered and, and completely customized and fabricated. And, and uh, Lord willing, hopefully early this next, early this fall, we're going to have this up and running, and we're going to be able to impact those people in those obscure pockets um, those, those individuals who are situated in back alleys or under the viaducts or through the passes, and we're going to be able to go and bring that resource um, through Engage Current to those people. Um, and so thankfully, I've been able to be a part um, of, of what's going on with Engage Current and Jason and the relationships that, that we've developed. And it's been, so, it's been such a blessing for me to be able to come and do these projects and interact with everybody, people like you, people that don't have the resources. Um, and so, again, everyone who came out yesterday, thank you guys for coming out. It's been such an unbelievable journey, um, meeting all of you guys, having interactions and, and conversation and community and fellowship has been just unbelievably rich. Um, and so, again, I want to thank you guys for your part and your, and your involvement. Again, I want to hand it over to, uh, to Jason. So thank you guys. Anyway, we'll just, there he goes. All right, there we go. Um, uh, but I, like I said, I like you, I like you to hear from people that um, in their environments are doing things that are are different than than the norm or what you would not expect to see in that environment. So. Uh, hopefully, maybe next year, maybe in, the, maybe in December when we're back, we'll be able to show you a picture of what, the, what that truck looks like and how we're using it in Tampa. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll have one in Las Vegas one day. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. do, do this. So, yeah. Um, so have you guys, have you ever, anyone ever experienced dehydration? Anyone ever been dehydrated? I, if you live in Las Vegas, you had to have... Experience. I'm dehydrated just walking from the hotel to my to my car. Um, it is hot, and it, I thought it was hot in Tampa. And I forget every time I'm here, I just walked into an oven. At least in Tampa, I'm in like a sauna. You know, it's a little wet. Here, it's like I just walked into a to an oven. Um, dehydration is uh, is an interesting thing. De being dehydrated is is not fun, and I think most of us have probably experienced dehydration and didn't even realize it because dehydration is more than just we passed out because we didn't have enough liquids in our body or we blacked out or something like that. Dehydration involves a lot of things. There's a lot of thirst indicators of being dehydrated. I experienced a little bit of this dehydration. Uh, the, one, the, the earliest that I can remember this was in middle school. I was in marching band. Anybody ever do, any, anybody else in band? Ever, ever in band? I'm the only nerd in the room. One, thank you. Thank you very much for making me feel normal. Um, I was actually in marching band. Here's a, if you have the, those images I gave you, there should be a picture of, the, look at that guy. Look at that kid right there. That is an, yeah, so just leave that up for a few minutes and, so they can soak that in. Um, that is uh, one of my favorite pictures. I called my mom. I said, listen, find the most embarrassingly uh, young picture of me with my saxophone from March, in, my, in my marching band uniform. So I started at eight years old playing the saxophone. And uh, I, I got pretty good at it. I got into middle school and got into marching band. And uh, since none of you have ever been in marching band, you won't understand this experience, but band camp always happens in the summer, just, just like any, you know, any other type of camps, always in the summer. But I've, I'm convinced that band directors, most of them probably should be in prison for uh, child abuse. Because it's there, suddenly, like when you get out on the field and it's time to do your marching and all that kind of stuff, suddenly band directors turn into Hitler. And, 
it's like it's like slave driving out there. And so I remember uh, back then the first time and uh, going to band camp, and I was so excited about it. And then about an hour into marching drills on this football field in the middle of summer in Florida that I wanted to kill the person that gave me the idea to be in marching band. And then I realized you gave yourself the idea, buddy. You can't do anything about that. You're here, you're stuck. But there was one redeeming quality. There was, there was this moment every day where something would show up and it was like heaven on earth, like God had dropped manna from heaven. I don't know if you remember these, but this next picture might remind you of these, uh, my saving grace. The McDonald's cooler, does anybody remember the McDonald's cooler with the orange drink? That we don't even know what's in the orange drink, but it tasted so good, there's probably crack in it. <laughs> the big yellow McDonald's cooler. At some point, somebody, a volunteer, a parent, whoever, would pull up in their vehicle, they'd pop the back of their vehicle, and out come these McDonald's coolers, and you knew, I don't care what's in that cooler, but I'm going to go dive in it, and it's going to make me feel better. Because marching out there and doing these drills, just sweating and, and uh, you know, getting dizzy and all this kind of stuff. But you see this McDonald's cooler and insta- even looking at it and knowing that what's in that cooler is going to quench my thirst and it's going to rehydrate me to keep going. Much of our life is kind of that same cycle. Because just, phys- just like physically, there are thirst indicators, right? When we get dehydrated, certain things start happening. Our attitude changes. We start falling apart a little bit. We, we get uh, our, our judgment starts getting clouded. Uh, we get weak. We start making bad decisions if we have to choose certain things. Like there are thirst indicators for us. There are, there's blurred vision that happens. There's things that start happening to us to tell us physically we are not hydrated and we need to get rehydrated or things are going to go very badly for us. And as much as we feed that, especially in our world of we're, we're so uh, much on working out and being fit and doing all these things, you got guys walking around with a gallon jug of water that they're carrying with them. And, you know, I think, you, why didn't you just go to the, go to the uh, junior store and get a big gulp and carry that around? I mean, that's per, just put a handle on that McDonald's cooler and you have your water that we're supposed to be drinking. I feel like every year it's like, well, we used to say it was eight glasses of water you need to drink a day. Now you need to drink a gallon of water a day. Now it's two gallons, whatever, you know. Just get a whole, just get a bucket and carry that around with you and drink that. Stick a straw in it. But we were so big on like, all right, I gotta, I gotta keep fit, I gotta keep hydrated, all these things. And that's great, and we should. But we don't do the same thing when it comes to our lives on a spiritual context. We operate so often so depleted and so dehydrated, and we often wonder why things are out of, out of joint. We often wonder why our decisions go badly. We often think, why are things so poor? Why, are my, why is my life the way it is? And all these, all these things, and we don't stop and step back and go, you know what? There's probably a spiritual McDonald's cooler around that I need to tap into that I'm ignoring. And there's a great story in the Bible Uh, with Jesus, uh, where he kind of deals with this idea of dehydration. In John chapter 7 is a very interesting story, and we're going to just read a couple of the verses uh, from here, but I want to give you the larger context of what's going on. In John chapter 7, Jesus uh, shows up at this festival, and here's what it says uh, in verse 37. On the last day, the climax of the festival, which I'll explain to you in a second, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, if you are thirsty, Come to me. If you believe in me, come and drink. For the scriptures declare that rivers of living water will flow out from within. Now, what's an interesting? Let me build the build the picture here for you, the context of what's going on. John chapter 7, this festival that it talks about is known as the Feast of Shelters, the Festival of Shelters. It's got to have a couple of different names. But in the Jewish calendar of all the, all the festivals throughout the year, this happened generally in the fall, and it was the largest festival that they would have. You see in the Gospels a lot of times where uh, families would leave their homes and they would travel uh, back to their birthplace and they would, they would celebrate 
the festival uh, in, their, in their calendar, in the Hebrew calendar. And this was one of those, the festival of shelters. Now, I, until I studied this, never even heard of this. And I didn't realize that this festival was actually the most joyous, the biggest, the craziest festival that they would, that they would celebrate. And what it memorialized was when the children of Israel, when they wandered in the desert for 40 years, and Jesus allowed, or God allowed their stroll in the desert for 40 years, and they wandered aimlessly in the desert, and they had the tabernacle, and they had God's provision in the desert. Even though God allowed them to stroll in that desert for 40 years, he took care of them while they were there. Even though it was pseudo punishment for them for not depending on him, he still provided for them in that desert. And so what this festival celebrated, it memorialized that time in Israel's history when they wandered in the desert and God provided their water and their food and their shelter when they were lost. And so Jesus comes onto the scene and it's festival time. Now at this point, Jesus was still relatively new. He was still kind of new in the scene. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't the rock star that he became. His own family did not even believe that he was who he said he was. In fact, at the very beginning of John chapter seven, the first couple of verses, this is what it says. After Jesus did some other stuff, Jesus stayed in Galilee going from village to village. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the festival of shelters. By the way, this is the only place in the New Testament that this festival of shelters is referred to by its name and referred to as what it is. So I think it's a key thing. So it was time for the festival of shelters. Listen to this. And Jesus' brothers urged him to go to Judea for the celebration. Listen to what they say. Go where your followers can see your miracles, they scoffed. You can't become a public figure if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, prove it to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. But I love Jesus' response. Jesus replied, now is not the right time for me to go. But you can go anytime and it will make no difference. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse, accuse it of sin and evil. You go on. I am not yet ready to go to this festival because my time has not yet come. I just love Jesus' response. Listen, guys, I get it. You guys go ahead. No one's going to care that you're there. It's not going to make any difference that you're there. So you guys go ahead. When it's my time to show up, I, this is why I believe it's okay for me to be late to things. Because Jesus said, I'm going to show up when I want to show up, all right? And when I show up is the right time to show up. Because that's when I showed up. So, um, so Jesus is like, listen, I'll be there when it's the right time. And that's what I'm going to do. So Jesus shows up. If you read through that chapter, Jesus shows up. He does some teaching. But and then we get to the verses I just read. On the last day of the festival, he gets up and he says, all right, now it's my time to tell you something. And he gets up. And what he says is so incredible. And what I find fascinating is how Jesus took the idea of what this festival was for to memorialize God's provision in the desert when they were desperate, when they were dehydrated, when they couldn't provide for themselves that God took care of them. Jesus takes that idea and he puts it in to their modern day and says, listen, if you are thirsty, we're here to celebrate God's provision in the desert when our people were thirsty. If you're thirsty now in your life, come and drink. If you believe in me, Come to me, come and drink. For the scriptures declare that rivers of living water will flow out from within. Now, there's some interesting things that he says here in this. That first statement, if you make notes in your Bible or whatever, circle this, because so much in the Bible is if-then principles. He said, the first thing he says there, if you are thirsty, come to me. Here's the first thing that he's saying to them. In order for you to get help, in order for you to get rehydrated, the first thing that you have to do is be honest that you are thirsty and you need rehydration. Because without honesty, we die. Have you ever been, have you ever played sports or something like that and you, you know, you got injured or 
sprained an ankle or something like that, and, and you, you said, no, no, I'm good. And, you know, the trainer's like, ah, you, let's go sit down. Let's get you on the bench. No, no, I'm good. I'm fine. I can handle it. I don't know if, I don't know if girls are like that, but guys are definitely like that. When we play sports. We're like, we're just completely dishonest about how bad we're hurt because we're not hurt. We're, we're fine. Yes, I understand that my, my foot is hanging off, just dangling. <laughs> Wrap it up, coach. Put some tape on it. I'm back in there. I'm fine. I'm totally fine. I got it. I got this. We do it all the time. But we do that spiritually as well. Or we don't even recognize that we are, that, that we're are thirstier, that we're broken. And we're very dishonest about it when it comes to our spiritual context of life. We don't want to admit. We don't want to be honest about the fact that I'm hurting. I need, I need something. And what Jesus says there is, listen, if you're thirsty, first of all, you got to be honest. Because otherwise you're going to die. When I was out on that field and that McDonald's cooler showed up and they said, listen, are you guys thirsty? Here, have some, have some orange drink. I could have said, no, I'm good. I'm not thirsty. I can barely talk because my tongue is swollen, but I'm good. Because my body's going to get it. I'll be fine. I had to be honest. Yeah, I'm dying of thirst. I'm going to go stick my mouth under that spigot and I'm going to elbow everyone else out of the way. Uh, elbow you in the thigh. And then I will drink whatever's in there because I'm dying, I'm thirsty. But he says, you gotta be honest, but not only you gotta be honest, but you gotta trust me to hydrate you. Physically, when we drink water, we don't tell the water where to go. We don't go, listen, water, my, my thigh muscle is a little dry. Can you get down there and lubricate that for me? The water knows where it needs to go. What Jesus is saying, listen, I know your struggle. I know, I understand you're thirsty. And if you're thirsty, if you'll be honest and come to me, I know where you need to be hydrated and I will hydrate you. Amen. The same way as when I was in middle school in that marching, I could, you know, I, I, I had to trust that what was in that McDonald's cooler was something that was going to quench my thirst. I had to trust that they didn't put hot coffee in that cooler, that there was something cold and refreshing that was going to revitalize me. And that's what Jesus is saying in this passage. Listen, trust me, because what I'm going to give you will revitalize you. It will help you. If you will trust me, if you will be honest, then I will do this. But he goes on, he doesn't leave you there. He says, if you believe in me, come and drink. Now, the fascinating thing to me is even in these two statements, he still puts the choice to us. He doesn't force it on us. He doesn't pop the top on that, on that cooler and say, I'm going to pour this all over you and you're going to drink it. I'm going to waterboard you and you're going to like it. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He says, listen, here's, here's the cooler. If you want it, you can drink it. But I'm not going to force you to. The choice is yours. It's in your hands to take that step. But listen to this. The next statement he says, if you believe in me, come and drink that word drink right there, if you make notes, circle that word because it's a fascinating word. The Greek verb that that English word drink comes from, when they translated it to that word drink, the Greek word that came from, the verb, what it literally means is continual gulps and repeated swallows. So what, it's, what he's saying there, because it, it almost sounds like he, he like repeats himself. If you're thirsty, come to me. If you believe in me, come and drink. Right, you, you said that the first time. But in the Greek language, when he, said, when he said what he said, doesn't read the same way as how we read it in English. What he said the first time is, if you're thirsty, come to me, trust me, I've got something for you. If you believe in me, come and drink repeatedly. Continually drink of what I have for you, which is, I think, something that we forget. Because we get in our spiritual context and we, we feel like, all right, I've taken that step over the line. I'm following Christ. And that's sometimes kind of where it ends for us. We forget that we have to continually go back to the well and we have to continually drink. It's a lifelong drinking process. When we hydrate ourselves and we drink water, we know we're thirsty. We don't just drink it one time. And, cool, I got my bottle of water. I'm set for life. We drink every day. We drink multiple times a day. We drink gallons of water a day to keep ourselves hydrated. But for some reason, spiritually, we don't do the same thing. We forget that we need to go back continually to 
the well to keep hydrating ourselves. And it's real easy because we get distracted a lot. We get distracted from things that we need, right? I'll give you a great example of this. When I do mission trip stuff, my buddy Corey here who works for Current as well, he can tell you this, he's been on multiple trips, especially to Vegas with me. But I, I get like singular focus and I completely forget that people like to eat food <laughs> and that there are meal times that people generally operate off of because I don't do that a whole lot. I was the kid in my family that at, at dinner time I, I wasn't hungry. And my parents thought that it was just a, a ploy for a while, and so they forced me to eat. Well, I remember distinctly one time at like six years old or five years, something like that, and parents making me eat dinner, and I was so worked up and anxious about it that I threw up at the table because I was not hungry, but I was like, I'm eating. I'm, I just remember crying and like throwing up and like crying some more because I wasn't hungry. And then, like, 9 o'clock, when it's time for me to go to bed, suddenly I was hungry. And it wasn't because I didn't want to go to bed, but I actually realized at that moment, oh, I'm hungry. I'm about to go to bed. I should eat some food first. Mom, can I get some food? And I'm like, no. We tried to force you at dinner. You threw it up. You don't get any more food. They didn't really do that. They weren't mean like that. They would let me eat. But they would stand at the kitchen table, judgingly staring at me as I ate. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm hungry, guys. Um, but so as an adult, I take, you know, people on a mission trip or whatever, and I forget that they like to eat at certain times of the day. And so, you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon, they're like, listen, are we going to eat sometime? I was like, yeah, we just, like we had, we had donuts earlier. Yeah, that was like six hours ago. Can we get some food? Oh, right. You guys eat on a regular meal schedule. Sorry. But we kind of do that spiritually, right? We kind of get distracted and we do all these things. And, we, uh, we, and, I, and I will say this, I think we get distracted by the habits and routines spiritually that we hold on to. And because it becomes this routine, that's exactly what it is. We go to church on Sunday because we're supposed to go to church on Sunday. It's not we're going to church on Sunday a lot of times because I'm dehydrated and I need to get rehydrated and that's a context for me to get rehydrated. We go through these, these routines because we've been told this is what we're supposed to do. And so we do them out of uh, kind of this, uh, you know, militant um, behavioral pattern rather than I am going to that thing. I am picking this book up because I need, I'm dehydrated and I need to get rehydrated and I need to find some hope. But I will say this, a lot of times I think that's, that's where we go to. And there's one thing that we always forget that is one way for us to get hydrated because there's, there's a lot of faucets for us, right? There's a lot of McDonald's coolers that we can tap into. Obviously, prayer is one of those. Um, trusting is one of those. Being open and honest. Being in community like this and being open and honest, just like uh, Faith, I think is her name, told that story earlier um, of what she was struggling with. We get rehydrated as we're honest about those things and people tell us, and feed into us. And we, even if we don't get any, if they don't tell anything from us, but just the fact of us being able to open up and put that on the table and say, I'm struggling with this. You don't have to give me an answer, but this is what I'm struggling with. Helps us rehydrate. But a lot of times in a spiritual context, we get so full and we become like a sponge that we just get fat and lazy and, and just sitting there on the table. And we think, all right, I am, I am spiritually full. I'm doing well. Yeah, but just like a sponge, we're supposed to squeeze that out so that we can continue to function. And one of the greatest faucets I think that we overlook is serving communities or serving other people around us. And what's fascinating to me is I think Jesus alludes to this in this passage because that last line of that of what he says there. For the scriptures declare that rivers of living water will flow out from within. Now, he's referring to the, the Holy Spirit, that when the Holy Spirit comes, there's going to be this constant flow through you. But it's also, that line is also a reference to the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'm just gonna, we're gonna look at one of the verses there in just a minute, or two of the verses there. But in Isaiah 58, Prior to these couple of verses, what God is saying to them is he's speaking to them about true and false worship. And he's saying to them, 
you, listen, you guys are fasting in this way, but I didn't ask you to fast in that way. You're doing it because you think that's what you're supposed to do to prove that you are right with me. And he's going through, he's listing all of these things. And then he gets to as the, uh, chap, or verse 10 through 12. And he says, you're doing all these other things, but if you do these things as I've asked you to do, then this will happen. Here's that if-then principle again. He's saying, you're, you're fasting and you're showing the world that you're fasting, but that's not what I wanted you to do. You're doing all these other things, but while you're saying this, you're also not helping these people that need help over here. And so he gets to verse 10 and look what it says. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then, big word there, the connection point, the jumping from, here's the principle. If you do this, then this will happen. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as day. The Lord will guide you continually. Listen to what he says, watering your life when you are dry and keeping you healthy. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Jesus, decades, centuries later, says to this crowd, if you're thirsty, come to me. If you believe in me, come and drink because rivers of living waters will flow out. I am bringing some water to you and I'm gonna leave with you in a little bit, but the Holy Spirit is gonna be here to continue this spring, this watering of life, just like in Isaiah when the prophet said, if you do this, I'll continually guide you, I will continually water your life and you will be like a well-watered garden in a desert that is barren but you will be the garden for that desert. And I think what Jesus is saying to us is essentially that we should be the McDonald's cooler to the world. There are moments in our individual lives when we step into the desert and God allows us to stroll in the desert. Because we need a reminder sometimes, just like, just like with the Israelites, they needed a reminder that God had them taken care of. But they, kick, they, they continually pushed against that and said, no, we want to do our own thing. And so God said, all right, go, go hang out in the desert for 40 years. Let's see, let's see how you, you fare there. But even though I pushed you into the desert, I'm going to take care of you while you're there. I'm still going to be there. I'm not going to leave you. But you have to look for me in the, in the moment of when the manna comes, that was me. When you find water in the desert, that was me. I was your well-watered garden. And now you, conversely, as you experience other people that are in the desert, I want you to be the well-watered garden for them because you were tapped into me and you were hydrated and you were continually, repeatedly drinking from the source so that you can give it out to others that are in the desert. Just like when that cooler pulled up in middle school and I was struggling to stand and I saw that cooler and I knew in that cooler was sustainability. What the world needs from us when the world is struggling with confusion and loss and doubt, when we individually are struggling with all of those things, we need to be the McDonald's cooler. We need the person next to us in community to be the McDonald's cooler for us. We, in turn, to the world, just like in that laundromat yesterday, need to be the McDonald's cooler to that family that says, I only had $40 in my pocket. And I don't completely understand what you mean by God's blessing, but I understand that there is hope in this and you've given me hope. And I want more of that hope. Are you, are you dehydrated today? Maybe you're wandering in that desert a little bit. Maybe you know somebody that's wandering in that desert. And my question to you is, have you been to them what God has been for you? And are you, as Jesus said, continually drinking? Are you continually coming back to me so that you can go to that person and you can be that hydration for them?